Hello, everyone, and welcome to USMLE Domination High Yield Tutorial number 22. Let's go ahead and get started like we always do with a high yield question. We have a 25-year-old male that presents to the ED with abdominal pain, diarrhea, and weight loss. Endoscopy showed transmural inflammation of his small bowel. His CT is shown below. Three weeks ago, he had flank pain and was found to have kidney stones. What was the most likely composition of his kidney stones? Was it calcium oxalate, struvite, uric acid, or cysteine? And I promise I'll come back to this at the very end of the talk. And we'll actually have a couple more. We'll have three more high yield questions throughout the course of this tutorial. So stay tuned, all very relevant for the USMLE. So I wanna to talk to you about inflammatory bowel disease. And inflammatory bowel disease is a very high yield topic for the USMLE. It's an idiopathic bowel disorder that includes both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And it's often very important to differentiate Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis on the USMLE. Now, both are going to present with abdominal pain, fever, probably bloody diarrhea, and weight loss. These are key uh, signs and symptoms of inflammatory bowel disease. It's usually diagnosed with endoscopy with very characteristic findings that we'll discuss. But often radiology is used, you know, typically CT, fluoroscopy sometimes, and even an MR interrography to, you know, evaluate and diagnose IBD or inflammatory bowel disease. And I think this is a very helpful chart to differentiate and understand the difference between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So in terms of location, Crohn's disease can really happen anywhere along the GI tract from the mouth to the anus, okay? But there are skip lesions. Oftentimes it'll affect maybe a part of the small bowel, a part of the large bowel, but not continuously. Whereas that's not the case for ulcerative colitis. There aren't skip lesions. And, you know, typically the rectum is always involved in ulcerative colitis, nearly always involved and then it you know, traverses along the colon and there's no skip lesion associated with it. The rectum is only involved in 10% of cases of Crohn's disease, so very important. And on endoscopy, you typically get transmural inflammation of the bowel, so the entire bowel wall, meaning the mucosa, the submucosa, the muscularis propria, uh, and the serosa, they're all involved with inflammation. Typically on pathology, you get non-caseating granulomas in Crohn's disease. In ulcerative colitis, you don't get this transmural inflammation, only the mucosa and sometimes a submucosa is involved. You often get crypt abscesses and ulcers, certainly not granulomas associated with UC or ulcerative colitis. The radiology findings can be very similar, but you know, typically we can get bowel wall thickening in both, but uh, typically you'll get mucosal enhancement and strictures, fistula, and combing of the mesentery are seen more commonly in Crohn's disease versus ulcerative colitis. But again, you can see there is overlap in the radiology findings. UC will typically also involve bowel wall thickening, particularly along the rectum and the colon, but there is this thing known as a lead pipe or featureless colon where you get loss of hostile markings. And I'll show you a, an example of that. That's very characteristic for ulcerative colitis that we don't classically see with Crohn's disease. There's this very interesting, you know, association with smoking and, and Crohn's disease. Smoking is a risk factor for Crohn's disease, but for some reason in UC, it is not a risk factor, and oftentimes it can actually make it better for reasons that are not well known uh, for ulcerative colitis. There are complications associated with Crohn's disease, so malabsorption is a big one that you should know for the USMLE. That can affect vitamin K, B12, iron, and calcium. Because it affects vitamin K, the prothrombin time can be elevated in, in, in some patient has Crohn's disease. That's an important point to remember for the USMLE. Uh, complications of ulcerative colitis include toxic megacolon and also the risk of colon cancer. Now, colon cancer is also uh, a complication of Crohn's disease, but you know, much more likely in UC or ulcerative colitis, okay? Um, and often perforation also is another complication that's more commonly seen in UC versus Crohn's disease. The extra intestinal manifestations are very similar across both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. You know, eye things like uveitis, peripheral arthritis, you know, that resembles, you know, ankylosing spondylitis, you know, typically a rash like pyoderma, granginosum, or erythema nodosum is seen in both. And primary sclerosing cholangitis can be seen in both, but more common in UC. So, you know, these extra intestinal manifestations are seen in both, but particularly PSE, primary sclerosing cholangitis is actually more common in UC versus Crohn's disease. And that's an important point to remember. So treatment in acute exacerbation, typically we use steroids, but, you know, azitho, azithoprine and infliximab is, is used for Crohn's disease and mesalamine and 6 mercaptopurine is used in UC. Now, colectomy is effective in ulcerative colitis. Typically, you know, if you get like a pan colectomy that can sometimes even be curative in UC, but it's often not very useful for Crohn's disease. And oftentimes when you do surgery, often it recurs at the pre-anastomatic site. Okay. So, you know, 
surgery is much better in UC versus Crohn's disease. And that's an important point to remember. But I want to show what this looks like on imaging. So on the left side here, we have a normal CT image. Okay. Remember that the top of the image is anterior. The uh, bottom of the image is posterior. This is an axial image. So we're like cutting the body like a loaf of bread. And again, you know, this is part of the liver that we're seeing here. This is part of the kidney. This is the vertebral body. The spinous process of the vertebral body. And, you know, these are the vessels. This is the aorta, the IVC. But I want to point your attention to the duodenum, which is the bowel, the small bowel right here, which is just anterior to the, you know, the aorta and the IVC. And notice that it has fluid in it and the wall is very thin and imperceptible here, right? So this is a normal appearance of uh, small bowel. But if you take a look here at this patient with Crohn's disease, this is, you know, near the terminal ileum. Notice how much bowel wall thickening there is. There's some contrast here, this bright signal here, but all this is the wall here and it's very thickened. And if we take a look here, this is a stricture where, you know, the, the bowel gets very narrowed here, right? This is part of the terminal ileum here. So this is a nice example of what a stricture would look like in the setting of Crohn's disease. Other examples here, we, again, we have, this is a, a loop of bowel here. There's marked bowel wall thickening. There's even, you know, mucosal, you know, hyper enhancement here, right? All examples of, of Crohn's disease. Here, this is a nice example of what combing of the mesentery looks like, you know, engorgement of the vasa recta, you know, in the mesentery, you know, coursing towards the bowel. This is a characteristic feature of Crohn's disease that we see on imaging, okay? This is a coronal view of the abdomen. Here we see the liver, the gallbladder. This is the stomach right here. Some of these are colonic loops and some of these are small bowel loops, but this is a nice example of what combing of the mesentery would look like. We also have, you know, bowel wall thickening here along the terminal ileum here with some contrast in the lumen and look how thick this wall is. The wall should only be like one or two millimeters, maximum three millimeters. This is like triple the size for wall thickening here. Okay, this is an example of what ulcerative colitis would look like. Again, we have a normal CT abdomen on the left side here. Again, for this is the liver here, the right kidney, the left kidney, the IVC, the aorta, the uh, vertebral body here, spinous process. And you know, these are these centrally are loops of small bowel, but on the longer periphery, this is a loop of large bowel, colon, right? We have, you know, all this dark area is stool and air within the colon. And again, notice that the wall is very thin, right? You know, very thin, imperceptible wall here, um, outlining a normal appearance of what the colon looks like. Contrast this to this loop of ascending colon where we have, you know, we do have stool here, but we have, you know, wall thickening here, right? So from here to here is the wall. You know, there's, there's some wall thickening, there's some edema or fat straining. This is this dark area is the mesenteric fat. We have some hazy appearance, which is fat straining that suggests inflammation around this thickened colonic wall in this patient with ulcerative colitis. And even the wall, part of it is a little dark and that represents submucosal edema. Remember in ulcerative colitis, it can affect you know, the mucosa and the submucosa. So we have some submucosal edema here and some fat straining or edema or inflammation around the wall. Nice example of what colonic inflammation would look like in the setting of ulcerative colitis. I want to show what a lead pipe colon also looks like. So normally, if you look at an x-ray, we see these normal hostile markings in the colon. You can see these, you know, gas filled loops of colon that are separated, you know, by these hostile markings here, right? So this is normal gas, normal gas, and this denser area here is the hostile markings that are normally seen in the colon, right? So that's normal. But here we have a lead pipe colon where there's no hostra, right? It's kind of a featureless colon where we see no hostile markings along this transverse loop of colon, right? So this is what we mean by a lead pipe colon or a featureless colon. This is a very characteristic image that they could show you on the USMLE to suggest ulcerative colitis here, okay? So very important high yield image. I wanna to turn to some questions that are related to the bowel and abdominal pain that are very high yield for the USMLE. So a 57 year old female on clindamycin presents with acute fulminant diarrhea. She has a low grade fever. What's the most likely diagnosis? So, you know, fulminant diarrhea, low grade fever are all signs and symptoms of of IBD or inflammatory bowel disease. So this could be ulcerative colitis, but the key here is the patient is on clindamycin. Clindamycin is a super high risk factor for getting C. diff colitis. You know, anytime you see clindamycin or cephalosporins on the USMLE and they develop diarrhea, you should automatically think of C. diff colitis. So that's the best answer here. Move on to this next question. A 32 year old male with abdominal pain was just diagnosed with ulcerative colitis. When should he get his screening colonoscopy? So this is preventive medicine, very important for the USMLE. All patients with ulcerative colitis should get a colonoscopy eight to 10 years after their initial diagnosis, and it should be repeated almost annually, either one to two years after that period, right? So very important for the USMLE. That's true for Crohn's disease as well. So anyone with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis should get 
a uh, screening colonoscopy eight to, 10 years, eight to 10 years after diagnosis, no matter what age they are. All right, this is an 87 year old female who presents with recurrent abdominal pain with alternating bouts of diarrhea and constipation. She reports no weight loss despite having seven bowel movements a day. What's the most likely diagnosis? So even in IBD, you can get many bowel movements, seven, eight, nine, 10 bouts of, of you know, diarrhea a day. But the key here is that there's no weight loss. In IBD, you often lose a lot of weight and often the diarrhea is also bloody. And in this case, the alternating bouts of diarrhea and constipation is a key feature uh, that this is irritable bowel syndrome. Okay, so irritable bowel syndrome, we often don't lose weight. You have alternating periods of diarrhea and constipation, and it often affects middle-aged females. This was a 47-year-old female, so classic clinical vignette for IBS or irritable bowel syndrome. I want to come back to our last or our first question that I asked at the beginning of the case, uh, which is a 25-year-old presenting to the ED with abdominal pain, diarrhea, and weight loss, all signs of IBD, right? Endoscopy shows transmural inflammation of his small bowel. Okay, so that means that this is a case of Crohn's disease, right? Transmural inflammation is a buzzword for Crohn's disease. His CT is shown below. That confirms Crohn's disease, right? We have the bowel wall thickening of the terminal ileum, a stricture of the terminal ileum, all, again, confirmative of Crohn's disease. Three weeks ago, he had flank pain and was found to have kidney stone. So what's the most likely composition of his kidney stone? This is, of course, none other than calcium oxalate. We typically see this because, remember, they get malabsorption of calcium and they develop oxalate. So, you know, they, they, they are predisposed to having calcium oxalate kidney stones. Also, they're predisposed to have uh, cholesterol gallstones as well, right? So this is a nice high yield case for the USMLE. Thank you so much for your attention. Tune in next week for another super high yield USMLE uh, vignette.